This is the Investor Connect podcast program. This is Hall T. Martin. I'm the host of the show in which we interview angel investors, venture capital, private equity, family offices, and many other investor groups for startups and growth companies. I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you for joining us. Well, hello, this is Hall Martin with Investor Connect. Today, we're here with Navrub Sadev, a Connection Science Fellow at MIT. Navrub, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us how you got into the early stage market? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I got into the whole blockchain rabbit hole, as we call it, a couple of years ago when I started out here in Boston and we were building a stealth startup, which is a crowdfunding platform for securities trading. And I started looking into how and what kind of market design and liquidity considerations are involved when you essentially have an underlying peer-to-peer network rather than a centralized network. And that, you know, sort of led me a lot into the more technology aspect, greater transparency, and really the economic efficiencies that can be gained and are involved by using a a new infrastructure technology. What exactly does your group focus on from a bigger picture point of view? Sorry, I don't follow the question. (laughs) So you focus on blockchain, but is there a specific goal of what your group is trying to accomplish or achieve? There's a lot going on in the blockchain space. Is there particular areas you're focused on? Yeah, so we're building a trading platform for crowdfunded equity. And that's, again, a very niche market in the United States at the moment, steadily growing right after the Jobs Act, particularly the, I think, the May 2016 when equity crowdfunding rules and regulations were clarified by the SEC. We really do think that is a way to democratize capital formation. More than 50% of the employees in the United States, for example, are in small and medium enterprises. That means the enterprises that employ less than 500 employees. And a lot of the economic growth is actually coming from the, the smaller scale economy, if you may. And I think one of the challenges for these startups is to acquire early stage capital. Now, with the, with the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis, what we saw was increased regulation for big banks and $32 billion up until now that went into compliance actually is the money, let's just say, which did not go into funding startups, providing small loans, so on and so forth. So there is simultaneous demand for capital and also supply of capital through the public who actually want to invest in projects that they care for, whether it's through reward-based or equity-based or donation-based crowdfunding models. So how do you think the blockchain is going to improve that situation and work with crowdfunding to get more capital out to these startups? So everything about blockchain is all the good things that we as investors are looking for, right? Things like transparency, reduced costs, easy interfaces to use. If you look at the public markets at the moment, there's actually no way to interact with or participate in the public markets without going through a trader broker. So I think that is really a game changer. If blockchain technology can enable peer-to-peer transactions and many of these inefficiencies in rent-seeking that economic actors do, entire businesses do, right? And that really is a crowdfunding sort of model, which also is facilitated and augmented by a technology that is completely in line with it. As with the ICOs and the blockchain, we now get into the use of tokens. And I understand you have a framework for valuing tokens. And this appears to be one of the key challenges in understanding the space is How do you put a value on a token for a digital system that is not yet built or may grow and change over time? What's your framework for valuing tokens? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. So that is some of our latest work, along with my co-authors, John Hargrave and Olga from Smart Valor. This is the first paper on behavioral economics, supplier token valuation. And what we really were fascinated by was how is it that value is being created out of thin air? And that took us on a journey to understand really how are investors perceiving and valuing these ICOs. So what we've done is adapted Jay Timon's model of entrepreneurship to token-based business model or a company or an ICO. There are no previous indicators available to figure out quote-unquote fundamental value of these businesses. And we are proposing and building on the fact that there are these mental heuristics or shortcuts that are involved learning from work on cognitive psychology and behavioral economics that are going on while investors are looking at these ICOs. For example, 
things like a lot of people compare with IPOs, but that is not a correct comparison. So really what the human brain is doing is it is substituting a much more difficult question with a simpler question. And again, the paper is available. It's in the public domain, whoever wants to access it. In a very simple one sentence, I would say it provides you a scorecard to value these startups on various indicators, things like comparative advantage, things like the team, like the token mechanics that are in place. And at the end of the day, it provides you an analytical tool to value some of these early companies. And so what do you think the key drivers are going to be with the valuation of the token and the blockchain? Another way, another challenge we found is blockchain brings a a whole new set of transparency elements to the table. How does that impact the value of the token as well? Well, I think it impacts it in a good way, right? There is a a uh, hundred years of literature on what is called information asymmetries in economics. So for ICOs and for early stage companies and startups that are looking to raise money through that channel, this provides you and greater transparency provides you a way to signal, as we call it, to the market for quality and address some of these information asymmetries. For example, if I'm starting a company, I know about the in and outs of the various team members, but an investor does not. So how do you communicate that, oh, hey, I have a five-star team, right? And so it is important to be transparent and it is important to be uh, fully open to the public, to the investors, uh, because again, it's, it's a crowdfunding model. We really see ICOs as a successor of equity crowdfunding. That's another paper I'm working on as a new channel for raising capital and a viable one. Indeed, I think blockchain itself has not yet promise, or or I want to say, fulfilled many of the promises, right? There are major infrastructure challenges that are in place. So, but I think what it has done is provided a new tool to raise capital. And for that, I think this framework is extremely valuable to people who are looking at some of these models seriously. Well, one of the things I've been looking at is if you had 10 companies that were distinct and separate, and then you had 10 companies that were tied together with a single blockchain, so they're much more digitally integrated, and you now had a robust digital ecosystem, what would be the delta in the difference in value between a token for these 10 companies and a token for these 10 companies all tied together? And how do you analyze or measure that incremental value because you've got this integration that goes on between them? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the companies that are deploying different blockchains are not fundamentally different from 10 companies that are using the same blockchain at the back end. At the end of the day, it is about the business. If these are 10 separate businesses, then these are 10 separate businesses, right? That's like saying, oh, I'm using Google servers, but are you as well? Or does that change anything between what we're doing well you're operating in your industry in your you know landscape and and uh, so am i so at the end of the day it's not so much about the technology and you know it's tied to i think your question really alludes to a larger question which is about the incentives that are in place for many of these i do a lot of these panel discussions and and a lot of people start from the technology itself right but i think it is important to actually start with the businesses and the incentives of it, like how many people understand the internet, right? I don't understand the internet, but I know the things it has enabled for for us, right? So it's a similar discussion for blockchain as well. And I think some of the work that I'm doing is trying to pivot this conversation to more as to what it can enable and what all it changes for the larger economy, for our economic structures and interactions as economic beings. And that thinking through has to happen before we build that infrastructure. So a lot of these systems are using tokens as utility tokens. You get access to the system, you get rights, you get some capability from the use of the token. But then with the ability to go and take it and sell it on the exchange for a gain, it now, the SEC now says, well, that's a security. That's not just a utility itself. So you see a lot of new models coming up like stable coins and tokens that can never leave the platform and so forth. What do you think the impact of the SEC is going to be on the value of it, given they're putting a very rigid security world on top of this new technology? Right. From the regulatory perspective, there is actually no viable way within the United States to have these utility tokens unless the SEC comes up with a different framework that exempts many of these ICOs from being securities, right? 
Now, that's a blanket regulation, and, and that is challenging. I think what it really is doing from a lot of companies that I'm advising and a lot of what I see in the ecosystem is that it's forcing companies to actually incorporate abroad or what we call jurisdiction shopping, who are more bullish on facilitating some of these new business models and the economic growth that it spurs. I do think that the SEC will take a measured stand at the end of the day, but the important criteria for anyone who is looking to invest in it would be what are the expectations when you're putting money in an ICO or a token sale? If you're looking for profit, there's, if the company is selling it something to make profit from, it is a security, no matter what they call it. So that's, that's fundamental to understand. However, if it really is providing a utility and you are not expecting any profits, then there is a case for a utility token. A good comparison would be your Starbucks reward cards, right? So those are only applicable if you're buying coffee from Starbucks and, and not from Dunkin' Donuts. And that is an example of a closed economy and is a better parallel than or with the IPOs, which really where a lot of confusion lies. So one of the models that's being proposed now to counter the SEC is the inability to take a token off of a platform and go sell it on an exchange for a gain. It can only, that token can only live on that platform, just like that Starbucks loyalty point or star can only be used at Starbucks. So it's limited. I can't go sell it anywhere else. And so it takes out the security aspect, so to speak, but same time now it limits the movement of that token. And so what impact does that have on the value of it, given you're now limiting its capability? That's right. I think that's a that's a very tough question because think about the incentives of the various parties involved, right? The company wants it to be on a secondary exchanges because that will drive up demand and hence the price of the token because of the trading and because of the market demand and supply. But then at the same time, you're probably in trouble from her securities law perspective, right? And you're not really fulfilling. Many of these tokens actually do not have uh, working products or platforms at the back end. All that is, is a promise or a digital uh, wallet or a signature, and not even in many cases. And in that case, it's purely for speculative purposes. And while it is counterproductive, I think what it has done is it has actually shown a lot of spotlight on the space. So now the regulators are seriously looking at the crypto space, which, you know, and, and investors, mom and pop investors, which all, who always thought that Bitcoin was some kind of fraud, the money laundering uh, <laughs> tool, are actually considering it a viable and uh, asset to invest in. So I think regulation is good, but the important thing is investor education. We always say light on regulation and heavy on education. Well, great. I'd love to dive into more about the framework at some point, but in the last couple of minutes of this interview, what else should we talk about that we haven't covered so far? I think one of the things that would be useful to this audience, to our investors who are looking at the crypto space, would be some of the economic implications that I earlier talked about, what I call the tokenization of the economy to pay attention to, right? It's fundamentally changing the way the way we do business, the sort of business models we have, the current economic structures we have in place. And I think if you are in business, essentially, it's changing the way we are perceiving value. And that is something to pay attention to if you are looking to be leaders in the space. Well, that's great. Appreciate your sharing those thoughts with us. What's the best way for the audience to get in touch with you? So I'm easily searchable on LinkedIn. And feel free to send me an email at contact at in. If you have any questions and concerns, I'm more than happy to share resources or answer questions to the investors and our audience here. Very good. Well, thank you so much for taking time and hope to have you back soon to dive into these topics in more detail. Thank you very much for having me. Investor Connect helps investors interested in startup funding. In this podcast series, experienced investors share their experience and advice. You can learn more at InvestorConnect.org. Alti Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions.